Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Hello, this is Dustin Hillis, CEO of Southwestern Family of Companies, and this is The Action Catalyst. Today, we have an exciting guest, Derek Pankow, who is the co-founder of Mythia, a software company that helps investors find NFTs. Their own NFT sold for $500,000 in just a week. And they've raised $2 million in venture capital from notable investors like the founders of Tinder and NerdWallet. Welcome to the Action Catalyst, Derek. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this. It's a hot topic. I'm in several groups with other CEOs and leaders, and this topic seems to come up on a frequent basis. A, a lot of times the conversation starts, though, with what the heck is an NFT? And there's a lot of people that don't even know what it is. So I'm sure there's other listeners here on the Action Catalyst having that same question. Sure. Yeah. So NFT stands for non-fungible token, which doesn't help explain it very much. But essentially, it's a digital way of proving that you own something. Ownership is it's a really important economic concept, like the fact that you own something. And so far, there hasn't really been a digital way to be able to prove that for you to go to someone who doesn't know you, who doesn't trust you and say, uh, I own this piece of real estate, I own this piece of art, I own this physical space, what, whatever the case may be. And so NFTs are a way of using blockchain technology to prove to the public in a way that everybody in the world can see, everybody in the world can verify that you own something. And in addition to the technological improvements, it's also been kind of a step forward in how people agree that this is a way to prove ownership is really important because a lot of finances is, is essentially agreements between people, right? Like I agree that gold is worth something. You agree gold is worth something. So it's worth something. Even if gold is not the rarest material in the world, because everyone agrees it's worth something, it's worth something. And likewise, because everybody is currently agreeing that NFTs is a provable way to, to show that you own something, this is kind of becoming the way that people in the digital world are proving that they own something. Did that make sense? Oh, oh totally. So when most people think of it, their knowledge is around art, because I think that was kind of the, the first or biggest way that it was introduced to the world. But it's much bigger than, than just that. Um, so could you kind of educate us? How did art become the NFT digital mechanism? And then what else are there as examples of NFTs? Yeah, so artwork and video games were kind of the two places where NFTs first got started. And similar to in real world art, let's say the Mona Lisa is worth $20 million, owning the, the quote unquote original piece of the Mona Lisa is worth a lot of money, even if everybody else can have replicas and can have photographs of the Mona Lisa. The fact that you own the original mean something and people have agreed that it's, it means something and therefore it's worth $20 million. Uh, likewise with NFTs, you can copy it, but the fact that you own the original, uh, meaning you own the NFT means something among people who've agreed that this is how you verify ownership and therefore it's worth whatever people are willing to trade it for. So artwork and video games is where this whole thing started, but it's definitely not where, uh, where I, I don't think it's where it's, it's going. And there's been a lot of additional use cases, a lot of additional ways people are using NFTs. I think one of the most interesting ways is using these as lifetime subscriptions, uh, which can replace subscription businesses. It's disrupting how people are doing conferences. Basically, instead of saying, I'm going to pay $3,000 per person for a conference, or I'm going to pay $100 a month for software, instead, you issue an NFT that either gets people into all your future conferences or gives you a lifetime access to the software suite. And then you collect a commission every time that asset is bought or sold. So you might say, hey, every time someone sells this NFT, I get 10% of that sale. So for the user, they get to prepay and you get to pre-book revenue upfront. But whenever someone decides, hey, I'm not using this anymore, I'm going to sell it to someone else, we get a percentage of that sale forever. So we get recurring revenue. Users get a great deal because they actually get an asset that can go up in value instead of just paying money out of pocket that you know goes to the company forever. The company also gets recurring revenue and upfront revenue. Wow. 
That's awesome. Yeah, here at Southwestern Family of Companies, one of our businesses is a education business and we're actually the oldest door-to-door direct selling business in the United States of America. And it would be interesting. So would that be the type of product if it's a residual product where people are paying $25 a month to learn everything from their kids' reading skills, math skills, science skills? Could that be an NFT? I would have to learn a little more about the specific business and the specific customers before I could say whether it's a good idea for that particular group or not. Um, one of the challenges with NFTs right now is that it is very, there's a lot of friction in how you go about acquiring an NFT. And it's, it's a lot of like technically difficult steps because you have to first get access to cryptocurrency via something like Coinbase transfer it to um, another wallet and then buy the NFT on a marketplace like OpenSea. And there's a lot of different like op- opportunities to get scammed along the way. There's a lot of technical kind of hurdles. So it's not the kind of product that feels very accessible to the average person yet. But I think in the next year or two, it will be. More and more people are building easy ways to interact with the ecosystem. But currently, the ecosystem still feels a little bit difficult to kind of interact with from a technical perspective. I gotcha. Okay, so that's good to kind of wrap our minds around what currently is not possible. What would you say is possible outside of art? So the listeners on the Action Catalyst are in every kind of business you can imagine. What would be the types of businesses that could benefit from their own NFT? Let me give you two examples that come to mind. Are you familiar with Gary Vee? I am. Okay, yeah. So Gary Vee, he's a public speaker, well-known kind of public figure in the entrepreneurial space. He launched his own NFT, I think about a year ago. When he launched the NFT, I don't think it was very expensive. I think a few hundred to, to like a couple thousand dollars, let's say. Today, it's worth many tens of thousands of dollars. And what the NFT does is it gets you into all his conferences for free. And today, the NFT to get you into an in- individual conference trades for about $5,000. But if you own his NFT that gets you into all of the conferences, it'll create a ticket every single time there's a new conference coming up. And so he's created a business that generates, I think, over $10 million a year uh, from this this conference business, booking a lot of revenue up front and also generating a lot of re- uh, recurring revenue while having his core audience that bought early actually making money. Uh, so instead of me paying to go to a conference, I've now bought an asset that's appreciating in value and I'm making money. So all his users are very happy and he's making a lot more money than if he just sold conference tickets because I think his conferences before were probably about $2,000. Now they sell for $6,000. Again, because having this tradable asset that generates trading volume, it's created a really interesting different way to approach the same business model. And a lot of people are doing similar things with software. So another example that comes to mind is um, Kevin Rose, the founder of Dig, uh, which was an early Reddit competitor. He he created a NFT collection called Proof, which when it first launched was about $5,000 to get one of these NFTs. Now it's about $100,000 for the same NFT. And again, what this, what this NFT gives you is access to his membership communities, his events, his software, access to his exclusive discords, interviews with other people in the space. So kind of an exclusive podcast or YouTube channel type of thing. So it's a, it's a kind of a all inclusive community experience. And again, a very similar dynamic. There's front loaded revenue for the company. There's recurring revenue for the company. Uh, his users have made a lot of money. So it's created a very enthusiastic fan base. And anyone who decides they're not interested in the product anymore can resell the product and get a profit on their initial investment. Well, those are some great examples that are very tangible. Let's rewind a little bit and just talk about how you got to where you are today. I know you are a serial entrepreneur with a background in many businesses. Uh, you co-founded Next Fitness, an AI-powered gym where computers track workouts. What was that? Yeah, so that was a company where we were building physical in-person gyms to compete with Equinox and 24-Hour Fitness where the core idea was we would teach computers to monitor your body and understand when you're doing a deadlift, when you're doing a bench press, and then count your reps for you and track how much weight you're lifting. Uh, Essentially, be your personal trainer without having to pay a human being $100 an hour to do that and be able to give that to everybody. Unfortunately, our technology became ready just as COVID hit. And so that just killed the whole gym industry for the next two years. So we kind of scrapped that business uh, right as the technology was was kind of nearing completion and, and being ready to take to market. So 
uh, bad timing on, on that particular front. But how I got here was I've been in crypto since like 2016 ish, not necessarily full time, but building different software products, different trading bots, being involved with different projects. And I started diving deeper into crypto around 2017. I had spent most of my career in e-commerce at first building my own e-commerce stores, selling drop shipping foosball tables, having an Amazon FBA store, selling vitamin gummy bears, Shopify stores, just running various different businesses of my own. And then I also ran e-commerce marketing for a large company, Kind Bars. Uh, they're in Starbucks and Target and Whole Foods, running all of their Facebook ads and YouTube ads and podcast ads and kind of a whole portfolio of marketing strategies. After that experience, I got a little bored with marketing and just wanted to do something completely different. And crypto and software development kind of came at the same time for me. The first thing I learned how to code was a cryptocurrency trading robot uh, or bot. And that was kind of how that, how that got started. So for us non-technical people that don't live in Silicon Valley, what is a trading robot? What does that mean and how does that work? It essentially means you have a theory for how to make money in the markets and you implement that in code. So you might say, I've noticed a pattern where if Bitcoin goes down, Ethereum tends to go down three hours later, then you can create a piece of software that monitors the price of Bitcoin and then trades the price of Ethereum anytime it notices that particular pattern. That's a very simplistic example. Usually the patterns are much more complex. But yeah, it's basically a it's a, it's an automated trader, so to speak. Wow. So your software for the NFT investor, it helps buyers spot big opportunities. Is that how? Give us a little bit more depth of, of how does that work? Yeah. So in the NFT space, social signals are really important, meaning how much conversation is happening around this NFT? How fast are their follower based growing on Twitter and on Discord. Discord's the primary where place where people are chatting in crypto. Um, how fast are those channels growing? How, not just in terms of how many people are following it, but how many messages per hour are happening on their channels. So we track a lot of those metrics and we help people figure out how fast different projects are growing and ideally spot opportunities before they are very expensive or difficult to get into. So the bot is listening to like what the normal world would call news channels, but you're saying Discord. Tell us a little bit about Discord. For the novice, kind of walk through what is Discord and how is it used? Discord is a chat service similar to Slack or Microsoft Teams, where you have channels where people are talking about different subjects and each organization or NFT company would have their own Discord server. And so what we do is we track how fast those servers are growing. So if last week you had 5,000 people in your server, and then this week you have 20,000 people, your server is growing very quickly. And that's a good sign that a lot of people are becoming interested in your company. They're becoming interested in your NFT. And that means there's a strong chance that it'll perform well financially in the future. Is Discord replacing Twitter? Does it compete with Twitter? No, I think they're, they're very different products. Twitter is a is a one to many product, meaning I'm one person and I broadcast my message to 100,000 people, right? Like I'm Elon Musk. I put out a tweet, 50,000 people like it. It's a one to many interaction. Discord is a, it, it's kind of a town hall, town square kind of experience where you uh, and a few hundred other people are having a conversation in a chat room. You're the mayor of the town hall if it's your Discord channel. Correct. Yeah. You set the rules and, and you guide the conversation. Okay. So let's talk about your company. So you recently sold a $500,000 NFT in a week. Why is that a big deal? And how were you able to pull it off? Yeah. So to clarify, it's not a, it's not one NFT that was $500,000. It was the portfolio of NFTs that we sold. That was oh, okay. That, well, that's good to know. So what was that? Yeah. So it is lifetime access to our software tools. We sold about, I think, about 860 NFTs at about $700 each, something like that. Yeah, essentially, the way people are thinking of our product is something like a Bloomberg terminal, but for NFTs. So investment research, figuring out what's going to be profitable, where's the state of the market, who owns what, how long have they owned it for, um, all kinds of different analytical data. And instead of paying like a Bloomberg terminal is $25,000 a year, um, we're taking the approach of creating an NFT, 
selling it for upfront revenue, and then making most of our money on taking a piece of secondary sales. So whenever someone resells their NFT, we get 5 to 10% of that. And then uh, we generate a lot more revenue from that over time than we made on the upfront sales. Fascinating. So you note that NFTs can revolutionize subscription businesses in particular. So kind of walk us through the future. Take us as an example. So we're the oldest direct sales company in the United States of America. Going into something like this would be like a whole new frontier for us where we were publishing Bibles in 1855. And now we publish educational books. And 15 years ago, we created web-based learning platforms that people do pay a subscription model to, but it's not an NFT. So how long would it be for a company like ours? We have uh, several thousand people that go door to door to sell it. So if we were a case study and you were to forecast the future, what would you say it would take for the world and our company to mesh to say, this is kind of what would happen for you to participate in this NFT world? Great question. So what is a typical monthly subscription for one of your customers? $29 a month. $29 a month. Perfect. Okay. So here's where I think NFTs can really shine and be really uh, a very interesting business model moving forward. So let's just call it 30, just, just for like a clean number. Uh, $30 a month is $360 a year for a piece of software that might normally be $30 a month. Someone might be willing to pay $500, $600, $700 for an NFT that gets you lifetime access to that product, right? Because that's, it's essentially, let's say one to two years of revenue that you get to collect all up front. But then for that user, if they ever get tired of it, they can just resell it to someone else, right? And you can dictate a percentage of royalty that you can collect off of that sale. And that's programmed into the software. So it can't be circumvented. So you might say, hey, if you re ever resell this NFT, I collect 10% of that. So if it's a $700 NFT, you get 70 bucks whenever it's resold to someone else. Um, and you get all, uh, all the revenue up front. What often happens is you have a core group of users that buy the NFT and are using the product. And then you have also a large group of people who are buying and selling the, uh, the NFT because they're either speculating on the value or they're buying it for a specific event. So maybe there's a book that's coming out. They just want to read that one book and then they resell it once they're finished with, with that, that product. Or there will be people who might hear about a book that they're looking forward to coming out and they think it's going to go up in value. So they buy it. And then once the book comes out, they resell it. So there's a lot of people who are trading the NFT who may not necessarily actually uh, use the product. So there's there's some mix of people in there. But what this allows you to do is, is it allows you to front load the revenue. So cash flow is a big deal for a lot of companies, right? If you're selling something for $30 a month, especially if there's a physical component to it, you're often outlaying a lot of capital up front to pay for if it's books, maybe it's printing costs. If it's hardware products, it's tooling and molding and shipping and manufacturing. Having two years of revenue up front is often a much better deal than $30 a month for the business, right? And for the user, if they're able to use a product for $700, use it for a year and then get $700 back, they essentially sort of get to use it for free. So it's a great deal for the user and the company also gets both the, the upfront money and the recurring revenue. So it's kind of a really good deal for everybody all around. It doesn't work for every company, but for the companies that this makes sense for, it makes a lot of sense for the company and for the users. And I don't think subscription businesses are going to be replaced by NFTs, but I think it's going to be, it'll be another business model that'll sit alongside subscription businesses that a lot of businesses will, will start kind of gravitating towards. That's a good way to think about it. Okay. So that's the company standpoint. What about the consumers? Like we're knocking on doors in every small town in America. So what would it take for the world to be able to buy these? Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, currently it's very difficult from a technical perspective to buy an NFT. In order for this to have, have a lot of people actually using it, I think A, it needs to be a lot easier to purchase. You need to be able to just take out a credit card and buy one. Right. You need to be able to have a easy interface where you can log in, kind of manage your NFTs, do it all in one place. And I think that's coming pretty soon. Coinbase, I think, is going to launch something like that in the next six months, approximately. And the ability to buy NFTs with credit cards is almost here as well. But uh, yeah, I think I think within the next 12 months, it'll be a lot more normal for the everyday person to be able to, to interact with this uh, this ecosystem. So I could just use my credit card to buy NFTs. So Visa and MasterCard don't have any problems with crypto. And there are ways to buy crypto with Visa and MasterCard already. 
crypto just tends to have a lot of fraud in it. And so a lot of people will use stolen credit cards to buy cryptocurrency. And because it's irreversible, once a cryptocurrency, once someone has stolen crypto, there's no way to recover it. Unlike a bank transfer or a credit card transaction, you can charge back, you can cancel an ECH trans transfer. The problem that Visa and MasterCard have is that people will use stolen credit cards to buy a lot of cryptocurrency. And so generally, it's not that Visa and MasterCard have blocked crypto, it's that the banks don't want to take on the risk of selling crypto. However, individual companies such as, such as Coinbase, which is a publicly traded company now, have gotten closer and closer to enabling people to buy crypto using uh, Visa and MasterCard. Again, Visa and MasterCard are fine with it. It's just that Coinbase hasn't found a way to do it where the business revenue outweighs the fraud losses, basically. We're, we're close to, to where you can get it with Visa and MasterCard and just buy it with a, with a credit card. That's awesome. Well, that's a, exciting. I, I do see the future in this and I do believe this is inevitable. We're, we're past the point. You know, back in the day, people would talk about crypto and NFTs and, and it was almost like with a smile on their face, like, oh, this fad that's happening. And it, it probably was similar to when cell phones came out and it was probably similar to when cars came out. You know, people still had those horses and buggies for a while. So this does seem to be an inevitable piece of, of the financial dynamics of the world moving forward. And Derek, this has been so fun talking with you and you know, with the listeners, I'm sure they're also wondering how to stay connected with you, how to hear more about this exciting company uh, that you have, Mythia. Could you spell that for us? M-Y-T-H-I-A. How do they find Mythia and how do they find you? Go to Mythia.com or uh, we're on Twitter, twitter.com slash Mythia. Uh, my personal Twitter is twitter.com slash D-Pankow, P-A-N-K-A-E-W. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Derek. And uh, I definitely feel I've learned more about the crypto world and the NFT world. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.